pray, Father, that they'll find hope. And knowing that this pleasure is with you. And Lord, I pray today, if there's any here that know you not as Savior, they may trust you. In Jesus' name. And we have requested that we sing three songs today. We'll sing the first one now. And they want all of us to sing together. So if you would, take a handbook there in front of you. Turn to page number 231. 231. This song is Murder to Religion at Calvary. 231. But when you come and I am filled with wonder, 
Sometimes I think I glimpse eternity You raise me up so I can stand on mountains You raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders You raise me up to more than I can be You raise me up so I can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. This time I'm going to read the obituary. Clarence Clayton Baker, 93, a boomer, went to the, be with the Lord on his Savior January 21, 2016. He was a Navy veteran of World War II. Clarence afterwards worked in the Union Carbide Elkham Medals and retired after 43 years of service. That's a long time to, to work anywhere, isn't it? 43 years. Clarence enjoyed golfing and spending time with his family. He was a faithful member of Boomer Baptist Church for many years and loved serving as an usher and attending the men's Sunday school class. In addition to his parents, he uh, was preceded in death by his son Clarence Wayne, sister Geneva Baker, and Joanne Bess, and brother Dexter Baker. Separated by death after 68 years of marriage and left to cherish his memory is his loving and devoted wife, Mary Rose Johnson Baker of Boomer. He is survived also by daughters Mary Elaine Ron Price of Boomer, Karen Rose, and David Fitzwater of Charleston. He was called Pops by his grandchildren, Michael and Christopher, Sherry and Beth, and Brittany and Lindsay, and great-grandchildren, Joshua, Kyle, Haley, Zoe, and Olivia, and Callie, and Abigail. So he had a lot of different names. Miss Baker, she called him, she, I, I think I was over the other day when she was talking, I thought she was talking about a stranger. He called him Michael. And I never knew him called by that name. Huh? We called him everything else. I want to mention a few things about Clarence. Pat will be bringing a message in a few minutes. But I feel like I'm a part of this family. I think I had every one of, them, of the children and grandchildren in school at one time or another. I think I've been with them, what, Karen, about, what, 39 years, something like that? So I feel like I've been a part of the family. Clarence was a great man. So I'm going to read some things about him, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you. He was a man that was involved. And it, that's really good. The church, as far as the church was concerned, uh, Clarence was, in other words, basically he's the last one. I started out teaching the men's class with 35 men in the class, and Clarence is the last one, last out of the 35 men. And I tell you, that's something. I, we, we watched every one of them pass away. But you know what the great thing was? Every one of them went home to see the be the Lord. Amen. You talk about a blessing. I attended all their funerals. And I tell you what, what a blessing to know that they knew the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we just read in the obituary that Clarence was a faithful member of Boomer Baptist Church. We said he was a nutcher, but he's also a trustee at one time in the church here. In other words, I, basically, he was in here, I, and he's in me in Sunday school class. I was thinking, I think Lester probably only had two teachers in about 65 years. Lester Nutter was his teacher first, and then I took over after Lester, Lester left and went back to North Carolina. So he had about 60 some years of two teachers. And so that's uh, very unusual too. And you know, most of the men that he was in the Sun School class with, most all of them worked with him at El Camino, at the Alloy, that's what they call it now. But that's who, that's who he was with in the Sunday School class. They were not strangers to each other for sure. They always had a good time. He used to tell them they wanted to talk during Sunday School time. And I said, whoa, whoa, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna have to come early. And some of the men took me up on that. They'd come about a half hour early and Clarence occasionally did, but not often, where they could get a chance to fellowship and have fun with each other in the Sunday school class. He's also, some other things about the church, he and Fred Neal and, and um, Mr. Nutter, David Nutter, they used to come over in the summertime 
and do a lot of painting around the church. If you go down the stairs after a while, you'll see the different colors, and Fred and Mr. Baker and all of them, that's what they did. They came in every summer, worked around the church, and painted, did a lot of different things. Clarence was always available when you're asking him to come. If you call him and tell him you had a need, he was always here to help. Another thing Miss Baker told me, I didn't have any idea, we wouldn't know this, that he read his Bible every night. Uh, if I had a show of hands tonight, I bet there's very few of you that read your Bible every night. He read it every night, and she said that occasionally he would come in from work and be very, very tired. He'd go to bed, and then he would get up before he laid down for the rest of the night and read his Bible. You know, that's, a, that's a commendable thing, just the fact that he could read it every night. That shows you he had some interest in the things of God, didn't it? He liked to read every night. So that's a little bit about, his, uh, about the church things there. And then also about his work. In other words, uh, if you remember, if you know anything about Alloy, some of you may be in here from Alloy work there, they all had nicknames. And his nickname was Bake. Bake, Miss Baker told me his name was Bake. I'm going to tell you something. Of all the names I've heard about the men working at Alloy, that's a very good name. <laughs> I've heard a lot of different names, and that's the best one I've ever heard. So I see some of you grinning in here. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I, they were going to tell me about the nicknames of some of the men in my class. I said, basically, I don't want to hear some of those. <laughs> so they, they had names for each one of them. So that's what he was. He, uh, he worked in the, uh, the traffic department for about 43 years. Uh, I'm sure he worked in other departments too, but he was basically with the traffic department there. And uh, I think about the men that worked with him, every one of them to the T, but in my class, they always said that Clarence had a very, very good work ethic that he could be counted on at work to do his job, and when he's through with his job, he would help other people. That's commendable also, isn't it? Sure is. Uh, most people, when they're through their work, they're ready to go home. <laughs> but he was. He always stayed around to try to help them. Then a little bit about the family. There's a little bit where I'm weaker on this because I didn't know how, how he interacted with his family, but Miss Baker filled me on some of them. Uh, his grandchildren called him Pops. That's what they called him, Pops. And so that's a different name for him. He had a lot of different names, Miss Baker. Every time I talk to somebody, they tell me about somebody different. I just wonder who they're talking about. And I tell you what, he took a lot of, took a lot of, uh, did a lot of living with his grandchildren and his children. Did a lot of things with them. I, I, I understand he did a lot of, did some fishing with uh, Chris and with Michael. Uh, I talked to Chris a little bit about that. And he played a little golf with them too. We'll be talking about the golf in a few minutes. And I think with, with Elaine and Karen, I think she said that he took, took them shopping a lot. Is that right, Elaine? She took you shopping. I want to tell you something. Not many fathers take their kids shopping and stay around a shopping center with their, with their girls. But he was able to do that. That showed you that he cared. It really does. And I think also the grandchildren, he was involved. He came to their athletic events. Karen played volleyball and Chris played basketball. And he came to some of those events and was enjoying himself to be able to watch that. Uh, I think when, I think Brittany, when you and Lindsay got a little better, I think he took you shopping too, didn't he? And they're shaking their heads, took her shopping. I'm going to tell one on, on you, Lindsay. All right, Miss Baker told me that Lindsay and Mr. Baker often played checkers, and Mr. Baker would not let her win. <laughs> Even as a little girl, he wouldn't let you win, would he? Uh, did he teach you anything? She told me a few minutes ago, she said, I'd be like a bee now. <laughs> Yeah, that guy could be him now. She, she's got good. It sounds like Clarence. In a few minutes, we'll talk about, about the golf game a little bit. He's pretty. And then also, he, another thing he did, somebody told me he was a whistler. A whistler. And the people at Boomaha, when he, he took his walk up Boomaha, they knew Clarence was coming because they could hear him whistling. They said, here comes the whistler. <laughs> I think Mary Grace, did you ever hear him whistle coming up the hall? Oh, I'm Mary shaking her head, yes. So he did a lot of whistling. Those are some of the things. And he also was a prankster. Now, Miss Baker, that's something I didn't really understand. I'm going to tell one, the one you told me. I think it's funny. Clarence came in when Miss Baker was in the living room. He was back in the kitchen somewhere. She heard a big thud. So she went back there, and he was laying in the floor, just laying flat in the floor. And so she tried to revive him. She did everything she could to revive Clarence. He wouldn't do, he wouldn't do anything. He just laid there. She was getting ready to call 911, call everybody. And you know what? He, he woke up. He was kidding. He pulled a prank on her. 
And Mrs. Baker, she told me, she said, I spoke to him. And I'm sure it was, she didn't appreciate that. And she said, I spoke to him. And I'm sure it's in a, probably a little low voice like Mrs. Baker had, right? She said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you another about him and Fred Neal. Uh, in my Sunday school class, uh, fellas always were, were working in their garden. They always come in every Sunday talking about their garden, talking about their garden. So I said, fellas, let's have a little contest here. When your garden comes in, bring it in and see who can raise the biggest and the best produce. So I think him and Brother Fred was involved with tomatoes. And they were watching each other's vines every day. They'd go look at each other's vines to see who had the best tomato. Well, Mr. Baker, I said, one time Mr. Baker, he said, I'm going to get ahead of Fred Neal. So he went to Kroger's <laughs> and bought the biggest red tomato you'd ever saw. <laughs> Took it out and tied it on his vine. <laughs> they said when Fred Neal came by, he about had a heart attack. He, he said he watched his head. He, went, he just kept looking. See, so he came in, he came in a Sunday school class, and Fred didn't know what it was. He didn't look that close. He said, well, I guess Clarence beat me. He got the biggest and best tomato first. Now, I don't know what other pranks he did, but those are two I know about, and both of them are pretty funny. So in other words, and then these activities, we just mentioned a few minutes ago that he was a golfer. He, play, he started out playing golf with Lester Nutter. They went up to Somerville to the course there. And I guess maybe he got really good, so he came back and he started playing with Mr. and Mrs. Maddox. His daughter's here today. They played together up at the Hawks Nest Golf School. And I think David Gill probably was also in that foursome because Miss Baker said she didn't go and play. So he played a lot of golf with Mr. Maddox, Miss Maddox. But I never could, never could get him to tell me which one was the best. And I come to the Sunday school, I said, which one, who, who won the most? Neither one of them would ever tell me. But I asked Chris, and he said, probably Mr. Maddox. <laughs> he probably won most of them. So he was in, involved in that. He, really, he did a lot, of, a lot of walking and did a lot of fishing and things like that, too. And so he was pretty active in, the, in his life. And if you know Clarence, he, he really enjoyed doing things. And then about his sicknesses and in his nursing home experience, he was in a nursing home for three and a half years. That's a long time. But I can tell you one thing for sure. That wasn't the beginning of his problems, was it, Mrs. Baker? He started having problems long before that. Uh, I first noticed in my Sunday school class because I asked him to pray at the end of the class one day. I asked him to pray, and he got to the end. He always thanked me for teaching the class. He forgot my name. Then I, I noticed other things he began to do, for, began to forget other people's names, men he'd worked with all of his life yesterday. He would forget their names. So that's where I first noticed that he had a problem. Of course, Mr. Bacon knew that he had the problem long before that. You know, I, I, as I went to the nursing home, I saw him struggling. It's hard to, hard to, he, hard, he's having a hard time remembering the very simplest of things. And, and that wasn't the kind of man that Clarence was. He was very strong physically. I don't know whether any of y'all ever shook hands with him or not. How many of you ever shook hands with Clarence Baker? I'll tell you what, he could put you on your knees. And he wasn't a big man, but boy, he had one of the strongest grips. That it, Ms. Baker, you told me one of the girls had a strong grip too. Took it after Clarence, I guess, because he really was strong. But he was strong mentally and physically. And that wasn't him in the nursing home for sure. So it, it, it kind, of, kind of bothered you when you went to see Clarence when he's like that. And I'll tell you another thing, Mary Rose and the family certainly are to be commended with the patience that they had in taking care of Clarence, Miss Baker especially. Because nobody knows what goes on in the home when somebody has Alzheimer's. So Miss Baker was there, she was by his side. And I don't think I ever went to see Clarence that Miss Baker wasn't there to comfort him, trying to bring comfort to him all the time. Stayed with him all day with him. And I tell you, that's to be commended because it wasn't an easy thing. Especially at home, it wasn't easy either. I was talking to David Fitzwater about his mother and Mr. Fitzwater. They went through some of the same things the years ago. So I, I think I, one thing for sure, uh, I think about Clarence, every time I saw him, he had a different ball cap on. I suspect somebody, a lot of you in the family bought him ball caps, because every time I go over, he had a different ball cap on. I don't know what his favorite was, but he always had one. Then I went a couple of times, and he had it on backwards. I said, Clarence, what's going to, on backwards? He couldn't tell me, but one of the ladies heard me and said, well, we put it on him. So they put him on him backwards. But then we also went over on the nursing home a lot to a special service, me and my wife went over there, and he came out for him, and a few times he was able to sing. 
Most of the time he'd sit very silent, but sometimes he sang. And I heard him over several times when he didn't know I was around, he'd be in the room singing, so he felt. Did he ever sing much at home, Mrs. Baker? Did he? Karen's shaking her head. I wonder because he seemed to really enjoy singing by himself. He really did. So that was a pretty good thing there too. And I, I think about also, you know, Clarence was a, a good man with a good name. Think about that. A good man with a good name. And, and, and that was known by, not, by all of his family and by his friends. Everybody you talked to knew Clarence to be a good man. And a good name, the Bible says a good name is better to have than anything, isn't it? A good name, and that's what Clarence had. I never talked to anybody. And the men in my class, they loved Clarence. They often kid with him. They had a great time. So that tells you something. The work relationship and the church relationship, he was right there with them all the time. You know what? You know, the family, they've lost a very special person. But you know what? Heaven has gained another saint. We've got to remember that. Clarence is not with us today. That's not him in that casket today. He's with the Lord. And that's, that should bring a lot of comfort to the family to this. I think one thing about him, too, I'd like to encourage the family to remember, remember all the good times and talk about it with each other. That way his memory will never die. You know, sometimes when people pass away, sometimes the family never talk about it. And I would encourage you all to talk about it. That way you get the opportunity to keep bringing up the good things. That, boy, he made your life more enjoyable. Because he really did. I don't think he did. So I appreciate the, the opportunity just to be a part of, of Clarence's home going, because that's what it is. So what we're going to do now is turn it over to the pastor and let him preach the message. If we can get the train down. Thank you for those wonderful words that you said about Mr. Baker. And I certainly appreciated those. Uh, in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18, the Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
Now notice these words. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You know, it's impossible to lose someone that we dearly love. Uh, someone that meant so much to us and not to feel sorrow. You're going to miss their presence. You're going to miss their love. And you're going to miss the times where they made you laugh. And there are memories that will linger with you uh, forever. Memories that you'll pass on. So how could you help but feel sorrow, and it's okay to feel sorrow. Even though we know that Mr. Baker is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's left this world of sorrow and sin and suffering, and now uh, he rejoices with the angels. He's uh, walking on the transparent streets of gold. But you, his family, well, you're here still on this earth, and you'll miss him. And that brings sorrow into our lives. And so Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica because they had experienced the loss of many dear people in their life. And he tells them, he said that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. He said it's okay to feel sorrow. It's only normal to feel sorrow. He said, but don't sorrow as if there's no hope. And you know, I hope in this passage of Scripture that you'll realize that there is hope beyond this time. There's hope beyond this moment. And death can seem so final. It can be so cold. It can be so cruel. But in this passage, Paul said there is hope beyond death. There's hope beyond this moment. This is not the end. And so today, maybe your heart is full of sorrow. But here in this passage of Scripture, Paul gives us three reasons why we can find hope in the time of death. In verse 14, we find hope in the resurrection. He said, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The words that he said, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Well, we know that Mr. Baker believed that. We know that he was a believer. We know that his precious wife, she's a believer. We know that his children, they're believers. And the Bible says, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. If there's any doubt as to where, you know, somebody that's saved, where they go when they die. Some people believe, well, you know, the grave, they lay there and they sleep until... You know, Jesus comes. That's not so because the Bible says even so, those that sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? How can he bring them with him if they're not there? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you know, Jesus said in John chapter 11 and verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Mr. Baker is more alive today than he's ever been any time while he was here on the earth. But we find hope in the resurrection. Because some 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this world, died on the cross of Calvary, was buried, and in three days he rose again. You know, that's power. Jesus said, he said, I lay down my life, and he said, I'll take it up again. That's power that you can lay down your life, and then you have the ability to take it up again. You know the Bible tells us. That it is appointed that the man wants to die. And after this the judgment. Friends in this moment. In this time we all take a moment. And we look at ourselves and realize. That this day is coming to us. Barring the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We all have an appointment with death. And then. What will the preacher say. About you. What will be your legacy? What will be your testimony? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior today and you've never trusted in Him, today is the perfect day for you to come to know the Lord as Savior. But we find, in, uh, we find hope in the resurrection. Then in verse 15 and 16, we find hope in the rapture. He said, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We that are the children of God and the church, we have hope in the rapture that one day Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to take us away from this old world of sin, Amen. sorrow, suffering, death, sickness. He's going to alleviate all of that. But in these words, Paul says that we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. You know, my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ knows exactly those that are His. He knows exactly where they're buried. He knows exactly where a cemetery is. He knows exactly where their grave is. He knows exactly who they are. And every one of His children, when the trumpet sounds and He comes back, that grave shall burst asunder. And they'll come forth. So we find hope in the rapture. But then in verse 17, we find a great hope in a reunion. In verse 17, then we which are alive and remain, now listen carefully, shall be caught up together with them. Who's them? Them are those that have raised first from the dead. See, a lot of times we think, well, there'll be a great reunion in heaven. There will be. But you know what? During the rapture, we don't even have to wait till we get to heaven. There's going to be a reunion in the air. Because Paul says that we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know what a blessed promise heaven brings to all of us that are his children. This is a moment of sadness and sadness because of separation. Death brings separation. It takes people from our lives that we don't want to lose. It takes people that are dear to us, precious to us, that have enriched our lives, that have helped us walk closer to God. Because of their testimony and because of their life. Because of who they were to us and what they meant to us. Death brings separation. But in heaven, there'll be no more separation. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sadness. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more sorrow. So today, as you sorrow, and in the days that lie ahead, as you sorrow, Sorrow with hope. Mm -hmm. Sorrow with hope. Amen. There's a greater hope that awaits all of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And in verse 18 he concludes, he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, I'm just a mortal man. I can't take the suffering, the heartache, and the grief that you feel, I can't take that away. There's nothing really that I could say that I could do anything more than maybe provide a little bit of hope and joy. But friends, the Word of God brings comfort and hope where there could be possibly no comfort and hope ever found. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, what's going to happen when death comes your way? What's going to happen when it's your family that gathers here? And they look and they see, what, what will the preacher say? Can they say, you know what? We know beyond any shadow of a doubt that they're with the Lord Jesus Christ and that one day you'll reunite again, that one day you can see them and hug them and rejoice all over heaven with them. Or will they have to stand and try their best to say something good about your life knowing that you didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. 
We're thankful that there's hope beyond this moment. We're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ that gave his life so that we might have life eternal. Father, we thank you for your kindness and your tender uh, mercies and your wonderful blessings. But, oh, Lord, I pray today if there's any here that don't know you as Savior, Lord, that you would convict them, that you would show them their need of salvation, you would show them their need of a Savior. Lord, that you'll show them that there is no promise of another tomorrow, but there is a promise of eternity. And that they may trust you before it's too late. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment. The scripture says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, there's a thief that said, Verily, or said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The day shalt thou be with me in paradise. That was all that it took. And maybe you're here today and you would say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know if I die and go to heaven. I don't know when my life comes to an end that I'd spend eternity in heaven. I'm afraid if I die, I'd go to hell. Would you pray for me when you pray? Would you be a hand? I just want to pray for you. God bless you. Would it be enough? Today is the day of salvation. Oh, Gary, if you come in. Close the service. We're going to sing another song together. Page 156. Page 156. The song is We Have Name. Page 156. Again, let's stand. Let's sing together. Page 156. Father, we come before you tonight or day, thanking you for this family. Lord, we we love them ourselves, and we know that if we love them, we know how much more you love them. So, Father, we pray that thou would be with them. Father, we pray that you'll meet them in a time of sorrow. We pray that you'll help them through this. Lord, not just today, but they're going to need help as the days go by. And help us, Lord, not to forget that, that we might be comfort to them several days and weeks into the future. But we know there will be more help there. Thank you for this family, and I know them well, and I thank you, Lord, for their testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that one that raised her hand today that needs Christ, that is the most important decision they'll ever make in their life, yes. if they trust Christ yes. as their Savior. So help them, Lord, not to forget that. Now, Lord, we pray you'll give us safety as we travel, not only today, but I pray you'll give safety as some of the family travel back home. So, Father, thank you for all that came today and honored Brother Clarence's homegoing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
soul so weary when troubles come and my heart burdened be then i am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me up so i can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas i am strong when i am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than i can be